everybody. Um, I'm pleased to be a part of this faculty research um, forum today and have just been delighted. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join all of you this morning. I actually was at the orthopedic surgeon yesterday and having uh, two meniscal tears um, diagnosed and confirmed. So I had my leg iced this morning to eliminate distractions so that I could focus all on, on you guys while I'm doing this presentation. So um, what I would like to do is start off by doing some brief introductions because um, Divya was telling me that people are coming from various factions and many of you are actually in the educational setting but I know I'm going to be bringing a new flavor to that shortly by even talking about my role not only as a clinical and school psychologist but also as a parent of a child on the autism spectrum. So let's do a brief set of introductions and what I would like to know before I move on to telling you a little bit about myself is to know about you. How many of you in the audience are actually students here at Governor State or, okay. So some students, and some of you may be raising your hand multiple times. How many of you are educators either in the public schools or even in higher education? I know quite a few of you, familiar faces, okay. And then how many of you are um, additional treaters where maybe, it seems like quite a few occupational therapists, physical therapists, okay. And last but not least, how many of you are personally impacted by a family member, child, or even yourself in terms of a disability? Please raise your hand. Okay, so quite a few. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce myself briefly, and you'll understand that as I'm beginning to talk about um, what I'm going to be presenting on today, I'm approaching it not only as a clinical and school psychologist of 20 years now, hard to believe, um, but also as a parent of a child with, um, with autism. So um, my professional journey actually began um, probably about in the summer of 1994. I came to Illinois as part of my um, pre-doctoral internship training, and I had the benefit of working not only in a hospital setting, but also in a school setting and also in home settings working with foster care placements that were at jeopardy of disruption due to issues that might have been going on. Um, and then shortly after having finished that up, I accepted a position in the schools here in the south suburbs. And during that time, had the benefit of starting in my applied training work, which involved working in various school settings, while I also completed my dis doctoral dissertation and then um, also did some work towards maintaining, getting my clinical licensure. So. Those were the pieces that were going on, and I can vividly remember my first IEP meeting that I participated in as a professional. And during that meeting, I was sitting at the table and very, very focused on doing a good job, as you might imagine, as a young school psychologist. And at some point during the meeting, I began to grit my teeth and feel this terrible pain that was going on inside. I literally had such extreme pain that bullets of sweat were coming down my forehead and I volunteered to make copies and stepped up and left the office and a colleague had driven me to the emergency room at which point it was determined that I was passing a kidney stone. So why am I sharing all of that with you? Because fast forward that to the summer of, to November actually of 2002, and again, another meaningful time in my journey was that once again, I was gritting my teeth, 
having beads of sweat pouring down my forehead and terrible pain, and I was becoming a parent, starting my journey as a parent of a child with special needs. Um, so I want, I'll be coming with that today, talking from both perspectives. I've had the benefit and privilege as a parent to, and as a psychologist, to have sat on many sides of the table. And I think it's been very powerful training, not only what I obtained um, professionally in my development, but obviously also through my walk and journey as a parent of a child with special needs. All right. So, oops, wrong one. In the educational setting, we frequently use terminology like partnerships, teamwork, Collaboration is actually a mainframe of as the role of a school psychologist. And it's seen as quite important how that has looked over time. I think like I was listening to some of you discuss has fortunately made some nice progressions. But what research now shows is that we should be working towards partnerships that are mutually supportive interactions between families and professionals focused on meeting the needs of children and families, and characterized by a sense of competence, commitment, equality, positive communication, respect, and trust. So why do I have an image of the Chicago Cubs up there? Well, sometimes teamwork doesn't always produce, does it? <laughs> So what we're going to talk about <laughs> are what are some of the variables that are going on that get in the way of this parent-school collaboration that we believe and are required to focus on. So first and foremost, what I'd like to take a few seconds and talk about are the legal imperatives that exist, the main one being IDEA, which is the individual's of Dis with Disabilities Education Act, and that was first formulated in 1997 and then was reauthorized in 2004. And on the screen, I have listed a number of items that are actually written into that law that really specifically make a heavy case for why parents, well, not why, but put the onus on school settings and professionals working in educational settings to involve parents in their child's educational process. We can't make parents do that, but again, this holds our feet to the fire as educators to say, parents are major players and should have a voice in their child's educational planning and work. So that comes from the legal imperative. And then we can talk about the research, which there uh, is pretty extensive research showing the academic, behavioral, and social emotional benefits of parent involvement. So actually the question that was just brought up is, where's psychology at with this? Psychology is very much on board and very hands-on with understanding the importance of those pieces. We know that we see improvements in test scores, we see improvements in academic functioning. We see perform improvements in school attendance, in motivation for homework, and all sorts of things that seem to set up in positive ways. So the research also supports what we see in terms of the legal mandates. Then we move on to ethically, and that's another important consideration whenever we're talking about what it is we're doing as treaters or interveners in any setting. And we want to be thinking about how are the choices that we're making impacting this child and this family. Another legal imperative that actually exists in the school setting is a term called in loco parentis, which means in place of the parents. And one of the things that I think comes up ethically that is important for us to think about is while we are called to step in and make help support decision making um, while the school is away or while the child is away from the parents and in school it's very important that we maintain a respect for what that parent role is and that we are operating in place of the parent not as the parent so why if we have these legal mandates that are requiring us, we know that the research is supporting, and ethically it makes good sense, 
why is this collaboration so hard? I'm going to get these up here. The first big reason um, that I believe this exists and that the literature tends to support is this importance of understanding its actual value. So what is, when we think about what we're putting our energies and efforts into, we always think about things from a cost-benefit framework. And again, now that as educators, we're more and more held to the standard of evidence-based practice, if we look at what the evidence is, again, we see that not only does it bolster student achievement and literacy and math, in, and in other educational areas. Not only does it benefit student behavior, it also, like some of our researchers and presenters were talking about, improves intervention efforts. And last but not least, in terms of the school setting, it enhances community partnerships. One of the things that was recently being talked about um, at the Southland Education and Health Initiative um, was a project that's actually been going on in the schools where they have something called the Parent Engagement Institute, and it's in Logan Square neighborhood, which is a high, um, high stress location, low SES, and lots of stressors that would be seeming to indicate a breakdown where we would suspect to see a breakdown in um, parent school community partnership. But what the um, Parent Engagement Institute has actually done is they've set up something where they talk with parents on the first day of school. They find parents who are interested and willing to serve and volunteer within the school setting five days a week, which seems like quite a bit, but parents are actually paid for some of that time at the end of the completion of a semester. They spend four days where they spend several hours in the classroom supporting educators. And then on the fifth day, what they do is they're involved in empowerment educational training aspects that are put on within the school. And what they found is not only has that not only set up some really wonderful outcomes for the parents who've been involved, but teachers are excited about it because they have additional support where they may not have extra sets of hands helping them out. Um, it also improves community partnership through parents who have familiarity and contacts with other parents in the neighborhood. So some really nice outcomes. And again, we start to say, okay, wow, that really makes sense. It seems to have value. So what are the problems that come up now that we know the benefit? Well, part of it comes into challenges that we face in the school setting that have to do with resources. Resources like time, financial issues that may be going on, or scheduling conflicts. And here at Governor State, even we've been under tremendous pressure as there have been has been the onset and talk about cuts. And so how does that affect how we're operating as a school? Those types of constraints regularly go on within the school settings as well. And um, time factors that may come into play, as you might ma imagine from a teacher perspective, would be that teachers are at an all-time high in terms of their levels of stress. So oftentimes what we're asking teachers to do in the classroom may be overwhelming and pushing them right over the brink. In terms of parents, as a parent of a child with special needs, I will tell you that time takes on a whole different element, right? The issues that may be in previous to becoming a parent, and I think this applies to all parenting, but is especially relevant to being a child with special needs, are that your time no longer is your own. And the differences that I think exist in terms of things that we see between a child who may not have special needs are that the time becomes, we're heading into the doctor today because we broke our arm because of our balance and coordination on our bike, right? There's those types of things that are constantly coming up, additional stressors as the audience pointed out earlier, and difficulties in terms of how parents can come up with ways to schedule when they're juggling everything that they may be juggle, juggling in addition to other children. Oops. Okay. Another challenge in parent-school collaboration comes down to this notion of 
speaking the same language. So the diagram up there says, raise your hand if you've ever seriously considered retiring from teacher because you can't keep up with the annual, you can't keep the annual acronym changes straight, right? So in education, we are famous for having a plethora of acronyms that we use regularly, and in special education, even more so. Oops, let me get to this. All right. So if you were a parent, <laughs> there's just the A list. Here's the B list. And there's the C list. And you're getting the idea. So that's the education. And when I'm training school psychologists, I regularly talk with them. Because of course, when students come into classes and they're initially learning this new language, they feel that level of confusion and feeling lost that I think it's important for them to capture so that they can carry that out when they're working with parents. Because it becomes very natural for us as professionals and educators to use this type of language. And oftentimes what we're not mindful of or it's easy to, because this is so natural for us, is to lose the perspective of the parent in terms of their ability to maintain an understanding with this. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay. Challenges, fear and overconfidence is another major concern that comes on and that can happen with not only the teacher but also the, let me get this, uh, nope. Sorry about that, guys. Not only from the perspective of the teacher, but also from the perspective of the parent. Um, but oftentimes our parents feel a great deal of fear and it's difficult to come in. Another challenge that goes on is prejudices and biases. And those we can look at the history of special needs and we see preconcision preconceptions of parental culpability. So that could be anything from the parent of a child with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, not having strong parenting skills, to a parent of a child with autism being a refrigerator mother. The diverse conceptualizations of challenges that the child has experienced, that's another issue that comes in that was a beautiful thing that was being discussed in the prior studies discussed, is how do parents and um, professionals get on the same page about that? And then there's also the value of education and experience. So that gets into this notion of remembering that even though we're spending significant time and we bring in educational background in terms of how we're going to treat children, um, that our parents are the primary experts on these little people, and they spend the largest amount of time and have the largest amount of interaction with them. Okay. There's loss of purpose and meaning as we work through reports, as we look at different mandates that are going on in the educational setting, especially that are driven by all those acronyms. It becomes very challenging. Team building and role agreements. So what is expected and what are we expecting of parents and how are we clearly articulating that and are we being sensitive to what the parents need? cultural issues, and that could go on and on from talking about anything from understanding economic limitations that a family may have when we're asking them to engage in an activity that's going to require considerable time or cost, to language barriers, to on and on. So how do we facilitate team success? We look at systems thinking. We look at joint training initiatives, and this is actually one of the things that sounds most similar to the prior research that I was listening to being discussed, which is where we have educators or the educational team members actually being involved in the work with the parents. So they're attending jointly and getting educated on whatever the, the issues may be and are collaborative in that effort. 
efficient routine communication between home and school. What does that look like? Um, that can be anything from, for one parent, them wanting regular daily notes, to another parent who needs a weekly update. The level of communication is important to consider because, again, that collaboration is so essential, but it's important that we find out what families are actually needing. The next factor is talking about school-based practices that are directed towards building trust, focused on problem solving and sharing decision making with parents. That seems like common sense, but again, as folks were talking about previously, a lot of times from the medical model perspective or even sometimes our own goodwill, desire to step in and say, I'm going to fix this problem, we're actually sending the wrong message that we don't want to be sending to parents. There also should be a focus on program improvement. This is something that's um, very much an evidence-based um, initiative within school psychology where we're looking at, as we start to integrate pieces that are going on to facilitate communication, to look at how we're going to reach all parents, is how do we not only look at whether the program's being utilized, but who are the folks that are not being reached? Again, this particular slide is looking at the notion that we need to be looking at programs and leadership initiatives because policies often drive what we're doing in the schools for better or for worse. And if those policies aren't written in a way that support that, then we struggle as well. Last but not least, ongoing sensitivity training. I decided to throw up there um, a number of resources, some of which you may have seen before. There's a book by um, John Elder Robinson called Look Me in the Eye, in which he talks about his experiences as growing up as an in a child with Asperger's syndrome. And then thinking in pictures with Temple Grandin, who's a well-known spokesperson. And last but not least, Ghost Boy, which was, is a recent release that's on the New York Times bestseller list that is about a young boy who's now an adult man who was able to get um, communication devices set up and with the benefit of technology where people had thought he was he suffered from a neurodegenerative disease and they thought he was basically not able to function at a level where he'd be comprehending what was going on around him and now he's able to talk about some of those experiences some of which have involved unfortunately and sadly abuse or where he's witnessed abuse um, with other other people that um, were his peers. So I always, one of the things I talk about um, as I encourage our students to think about training experiences is this notion of as we may come in with our preconceived biases about what this child may or may not be able to do, oftentimes we don't know. As much as we may know, there are many things that we do not know. And what do we want this child or family to say about us if they write their story? And lastly, two other wonderful um, training and cultural sensitivity types of pieces are the Jane Elliott um, training, which is the, the brown-eyed, blue-eyed. I don't know if many of you have heard of that before. So that's a wonderful one that looks at the impact of discrimination. And she specifically started that off back in the 60s, ironically, in Iowa, where I'm from, and had students divided up in the class where they wore collars. And she said that the blue-eyed students were inferior to the brown-eyed students and was very explicit about that. And through her research, what they found is student performance declined. Um, there were emotional challenges, things that what, of what we not only see with um, individuals from various racial backgrounds or cultural ethnicity, but also with children with special needs. And then last but not least, there's Rick Lavoie's Fat City, which is a, a recommended watch if you haven't, where he talks about fat being the acronym for frustration, anxiety, and tension, and he walks educators through um, the experience of um, what it might be like to have a learning disability. Okay, so any questions? <laughs> Thank you.